Good morning, everybody. My name is George Cole from Atlanta, Georgia. This is National Credit Educational Services, and I'm delighted to speak to everyone this morning about credit. And we're going to go over how you build credit, how you establish credit, the pitfalls of credit, what you have to really pay close attention to when dealing with credit situations, because credit restoration and having good credit in today's society is one of the most important aspects of what it is that you need to do to be able to take your life to the next level, to really be able to understand how to navigate through your finances, and to really be able to start building wealth and learning how to budget and, and, and what are some of the traps about credit. And the more that we can understand and how interest works, the more successful that we can be in, in, in America at this time. Well, the first thing, you know, you want to have good credit so you can travel, you want to get married, you want to buy a house, you want to start a family, you know, get a car, a laptop, uh, basically represents a business again, and of course the cruise ship is more travel. Next. The next thing is, is our agenda is to introduce National Credit Educational Services mission. The credit pitfalls, the traps, and the remedies to overcome these current situations. Common misconceptions, what people may think. You know, people just have a blurred vision about credit. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to get out of trouble. They don't know, you know, how to navigate through. They, you know, they think that this is right, that's right. There's really nobody out here who's really teaching us correctly how to deal with credit. And therefore, if you don't know, you're going to be doing the wrong thing for three or four years and it was all together wrong. Or you made another decision, like what type of bankruptcy you may needed to do, and, and it was the wrong one. And a lot of times attorneys don't explain and get in detail and depth with you about how you can protect your assets. You can charge this off, charge your pool off, charge your second mortgage off, charge all your credit cards off, and keep the first mortgage on your house. That would put you back into the game where you, uh, where your mortgage really should be. And, but, you know, but if you start getting behind, what do we do? Sometimes we may be talking to them doing the Chapter 7, and it wasn't necessary. See, because sometimes within the Chapter 13, you can include so many things to get, uh, uh, you know, discharged, where you don't even owe that debt, and still keep your house. Let me just give you a quick example. So, say you owe $300,000 on your house, but your first mortgage is $180,000. Your second mortgage is $120,000. Then you got a pool back there, it's $30,000 loan, and you had $60,000 worth of credit card. So, you know, you're like, wow, I can't afford all this. But really, your first mortgage at $1,800 is only $1,200 a month. But with that second mortgage, it's another $1,000. And see, the second is what's throwing you out of the game. And then, then you have all the credit cards that's hurting you. Then you might have two car payments, but it's just you. So you really only need one car. So do you know that you can discharge one of the cars, give it back, not own anything, discharge the pool and keep it because it's fixed, it's in your backyard, you can't take it, discharge all the $50,000 worth of credit cards, and, and, and get rid of all the collections, discharge all of that, and keep your house and only pay $1,200 a month, and keep one of the cars that's $400 a month. And now you're back in the game and you kept your house and all you own your house now is 180 instead of over 300,000 and and also discharge all those penalty fees and all that other stuff. I mean, but that's what National Credit here is to do is to help navigate you and give you advice on how to protect yourself in hard times. Now, I just wonder if you went and did a chapter 7 discharge in that example and got rid of everything. You know. And then you find out later that you could have kept your house. I mean, it's not funny, but, you know, you find out later that, you know, you lost everything, and now it's going to take you three years to five years after bankruptcy to get another house. And you end up would have been able to keep a house for 180 for what it's actually worth in today's market, but it was worth 300 350 when you bought it, and you just lost a major uh, come up. You know, you lost a major gain that you could have leveraged your credit, leveraged your bad situation to win. That's why we encourage people to come and to listen to what it is that we're talking about, to come to our corporate office so that you can know what to do. I mean, that's just one trap. There's so many more obstacles dealing with finances. And like I said, I don't care if you watch Good Morning America, to the Today Show, anywhere. They're not telling you this kind of stuff. I mean, you know, because this protects banks, you know. 
Some people get it and know what to do, but a lot of people, they don't give you this information. They put you in the wrong bankruptcy. It doesn't matter. It gives you the temporary relief that you're looking for, and a lot of times that's all we, that's all we need. The next thing is uh, personal credit, budgeting, and moving forward. We're going to talk about that. We're going to have a conclusions, and then we'll have any questions and uh, comments that we may have. Next, NCS mission statement. NCS mission statement is to educate the masses on the pitfalls of credit. You know, that's what we were just speaking about. Also, to leverage credit, to build assets and not liabilities. You want to be able to build assets. You want to be able to build, you know, things that's worth money, not liabilities, things that you lose money on. We'll talk about that. We've got perfect illustrations to show you how that works. Next is to empower people to navigate their finances confidently. We want to show you how to navigate your finances so you can come up. It is easy in America to come up. It is not hard, but it's our, it's our do's and our wants and the things that we do that mix up the success that we could have. Next is to empower people to navigate their finances confidently. This is what we want to do. We want to empower people to navigate their finances confidently. And then our goal is to restore America by restoring you. Because if we put you back in the game, we're helping to put America back in the game. The next thing is, is the Fair Credit Reporting Act of 1971. This act was created to protect consumers of unfair uh, credit practices, of how things must be accurate, things cannot be erroneous, things cannot be obsolete, things must be accurate in order to be put on your credit report. Failure to put things on your credit report accurately is, is, is something, is grounds for it to be removed or grounds for it to be updated the way we like to do. See, you got to understand who the three major credit reporting agencies are. Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. These three companies are privately owned. They're in business to make money. They're not our friends. They're not a part of the government. Their whole position is to collect and maintain information about consumers' credit history. It's really none of their business. This relationship is between me and Bank of America. It's between me and Chase. How would you like a, a bureau watching your marriage and reporting every time y'all get in an argument? And every time you get in an argument, it gets reported, and then all of a sudden, you can't get a job because... They say that you argue at home too much. How are you in my business? How do you get to report my information on me and never talk to me about was I late or not? Or is this really mine? Or is this amount correct? Was it really a repo? Can I get an opinion? No, you don't have any opinion. All we are is a pawn used for the credit reporting agencies to make money on us by selling our information to predators, sharks, loan sharks, you know, the worst kind of credit. You know, you can live in a $2 million house, but if your credit score is 550, you are not going to get mail from American Express. You are not going to get mail from Discover Card because of your zip code. You're going to get mail from Orchard Bank, from Providian, Capital One, Cross Country, Aspire Card. You're going to get third chance credit. That's the opportunity you're going to get. How did they find you in this beautiful, plush neighborhood? Guess who sold them your information? It's how they make money. And so the thing about it is bad credit is worth a lot of money. So you have to be careful that we are nothing but people that could be easily victimized. Somebody's reporting something on my behalf. Well, really, you know, back in the old days, if you're old enough to remember, is that when people used to apply for credit, You'd have to write down Montgomery Wards and J.C. Penney's and Sears and Robux and, you know, all these stores. You'd have to write down your account number, your phone number, and everything before when you apply for credit. Then that person you were applying for credit with, like, say, household finance or a bank, they would turn around and call each one of these creditors to verify, are you paying on time? It would take a week for you to get the answer. But now, you get instant answers. Because they decided to let the three major credit reporting agencies house your information. So they communicate to them how you're paying. But then there's an accuracy issue. There's, there's, uh, 
there's there's there, there's similar names, similar addresses, junior, senior, second, third. There's all kind of ways to put the wrong information on the wrong person's credit report. So you have to be accurate. But you never communicate to me, but you're accurate. That's impossible. Well, if the credit reporting agencies are so accurate, then why is it that basically you can pull your credit report? You got this account says it's open. This account says it's closed. This account says it's charged off. It's the same account, but you got three different readings, three different balances. You know, if you're accurate, information should be consistent. The three major credit reporting agencies, Equifax, Treasury, and Experian, do not like each other. They can't stand each other. They hate each other. They're like Coke and Pepsi, like McDonald's and Burger King. What are those called? Home Depot and Lowe's. What are they called? Competitors. They compete against one another for business. You know? And so how they get business is, you know, they hate that Home Depot is stationed in Atlanta, Georgia. Therefore, across the country, primarily, Home Depot would probably pull from Equifax since Equifax is here in Atlanta. But then when you got a Home Depot in Dallas, that's where Experian is at. Experian said, no, let us pull in this region because a lot of people's credit may not be on Equifax that we got here because they do business with local retailers and local stores. Plus, we report late payments faster than Equifax do. At 12.01 midnight, bang, that late payment is on your credit. And so therefore, you don't, you know, Equifax reports it five days later. I hope you get my drip. What I'm saying is they compete to show how much damage they could do so that the lenders have a true picture as quick as possible of who you are and who they're lending to. The credit reporting agencies are there to protect the lender from all risk, and they compete against one another. That's why they have, they have sales reps that go out to create new markets to pull credit. The first market they went to was the insurance companies. Insurance companies say, well, why do I need to pull credit? I just need to pull their driving record, their DMV record. No, 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 no. You're not making the money you could be making. Well, how can we make more money? Pull their credit, and once you pull their credit, you can see that basically that this person could commit insurance fraud. Why? Because they got charge-offs. They got collections. They got slow payments. This person got a credit issue, financial issues. So therefore, they could commit insurance fraud and cost you more. Forget the driving record. Wow. How much more can we charge? Two and three times more for car insurance because of a credit report not being over 600. So please do understand that's the cost of having negative information on your credit report. Significant cost. The next thing is, they went to the utility companies. TXU was the first utility company. Texas Utilities, to start using credit scores to determine people's utility rates. You know in the state of Texas, the therm and BTU rate and all that stuff is like 0 .49, but do you know if your credit is under 600, you're paying like 1.5 per therm and BTU, you're paying two and three times, you know, the, the, the actual rate that your neighbor's paying? Are you kidding me? Well, the credit reporting agencies gave them these ideas so that they can do what? Pool credit. So now they got to pull a full credit report on everybody. What that does, it gives money to the credit reporting agencies. Credit reporting agencies gave them the idea of how to shake and rob us. This is almost like the Robin Hood, the Neanderthal days, the days of Vikings and people fighting for land and fighting like Braveheart, almost where people are fighting for peace and fighting for uh, equality and fighting for an opportunity to be wealthy. You have an opportunity to be wealthy. But if you're unfamiliar with these pitfalls and traps about credit and how credit can really destroy you, but we're going to talk about leveraging it, too, and how it really helps you. But you got to understand, when people come into our program, they got to take it very seriously. Because I'm very serious and, and passionate about getting people to the next level. You know, this credit restoration is not a pill of magic that now you can go out and pay your house late, pay your car late, pay everything late, ignore all the calls when you think everything's going to be magically taken care of. No. It's one side of credit restoration and our education. The other side is your commitment to do what you need to do to make sure that you're protecting yourselves so that you know. That's why we ask our customers, we send out 6,000 emails every, every twice a week, three times a week to get people to come and join in 
so that they can hear and be educated about credit. So they become better stewards over their finances. So that they'll be able to understand how to use the credit to work in their behalf. To understand the pitfalls and to understand how to really re-engage your credit. Because you can come, you can become flat out rich if you know how to use your credit to begin to start building. When we continued with credit accuracies, as research company in Washington, D.C. did research of 200 uh, random people, and they found that 80% of the information on this person's credit was inaccurate. They found that these errors could cost the scores 50, 80 points or more, just one error. You know, how these errors occur, they, they occur because the, the information was in and the name was misspelled. The address was incorrect. May have, you know, just likewise names, likewise social, similar information. Come on, there's credit reporting agencies work in Brazil, they work in Africa, they're in Puerto Rico, all through the U.S. They're all over the country. They're in England, London, Spain, and Spokane. I mean, they're everywhere, to the Golden Gate, to everywhere. And so, therefore, how can you possibly maintain all these gobbles and gobbles of people and really do an accurate job. It's impossible. So therefore, the accuracy of this information is, is, is hor horrific. Okay, the next company, there's a fourth company. It doesn't stop at Equifax Trade Experience. The next company is FICO. Who is FICO? FICO is very important in this game. FICO is the credit score that's created from the data that the credit reporting agencies gather. The credit reporting agencies gather all this information. The FICO looks down and creates a score off of the behavior. It is a statistical methodology to evaluate an individual's credit worthiness, really to evaluate your character, evaluate who you are. So what do the credit reporting agencies do? What FICO do? They went out to go to employers now to sell them to pool credit reports. Don't look at these references. Don't even call the reference. Look at the credit score and look at the credit report. That's enough data right there to tell you who you're hiring. If that person's late on their payments, they're probably going to be late coming to work. If the person got a lot of charge-offs and collections, that means they didn't pay for their goods and services, it's a good chance that they may, not, they may steal and you can't trust them. I think this is a total inaccuracy of a person's character and why you shouldn't hire them. But guess what? That's what goes on in America today. People are losing jobs, government jobs, one year away from retiring, losing their job because of their credit report. I have trusted you for 19 years, but now all of a sudden, one year after ret up to retirement, I don't trust you no more. People are downsizing people's incomes because of their credit report, telling them they can no longer work in this department. You gotta go from a GS-13 to a GS-4. How in the heck am I gonna live off of that? The GS-13 pays me 75,000, a GS4 is an entry level, pay $28,000. Or leave. I mean, that's your other option. You can just quit. Go. Move away. You're one year from retirement. We can already save a bundle. See, people wait until they need credit. They wait until they want to buy something. They wait until they get turned down for a car or for a house or a credit card or a student loan. Then they come running to me. But see, we don't prepare ourselves for situations that come. Preparation is so key in America. You know, you can't wait to, this is what you want to do. See, because the dream house, the dream car, the dream business, the opportunity of a lifetime could come your way and you weren't prepared for it. And so this is what it's all about. That's why you go to college right after high school. So you prepare yourself for success, for a solid, it doesn't mean the college, is, is, you have to do it, don't get me wrong, because many people are very successful without it. But I'm saying whatever they did, they prepared themselves for a long term of success. So now, the creditors, basically, you know, I mean, the FICO scores range from 300 to 850. 300 being the worst, 850 being the best. When people look at how you're judged on your credit, this is a credit composition. This is how FICO looks at you and your behavior. So 35% of your score has to do with paid as agreed. That's a huge factor. That's a huge factor. You know, what is a 30-day late payment? 30-day late payment 
is 30 days late. If your payment is due on March 1st and you make your payment on March 2nd, I just had a friend on the phone ask me, am I late, am I late? Yeah, you're late with the creditor, but you with the internal creditor, but you're not late with the credit reporting agency. In order for you to be late where they report a late payment, if your payment is due on March 1st, they would report that to the credit reporting agency on March 31st. That means you're 30 days late. You're not 30 days late. You're just one day late. You don't even want to be that. Because especially with credit cards, especially with secure type credit cards, you will now basically will be uh, in a position to where, you know, they won't extend your balance or extend your credit limit because you have internal lates. But it's still being reported paid as agreed. That's 35% of your score. One late payment. We can get you billed up to a 750. Then you turn around and get one late payment or one new collection hit your credit report, you lost 60 to 80 points. So you got a late payment. Credit score went from 780, I mean 750 to 680. Get another late payment or a collection. Now you're down to 620. I mean, it flies down. You got to remember, this information stays in your credit report for seven years unless you get help from companies like ours. The next factor is the second largest factor in this chart is your balances. They can't judge you on your balance on your house. They can't judge you on your balance on your car. But they can judge you on your balance on your credit cards because you totally control your credit cards. See, your house and car are installment loans. So there's either 72 installments or 360 installments for a house or 180 installments for a house. We always say let's get 180 installments on a house. But there's no need paying three times for your house. 180 180 mortgage will only pay you, will only pay, you'll pay about 1.75 for the house instead of three times. The payment may be $150 to $200 higher if you're around a 160 bracket, but I'd rather accelerate my interest. And we always talk about the mortgage thing too, is that you want to split your payment. You get a 15 year loan, if your payment is $1,000 a month, you want to pay $500 every two weeks. See, you're charged for interest only if you use it. If you don't use it, then more of your payment goes towards your principal. Okay? I know I'm getting off track for a second, but we'll get back on. And so the thing about it is, say this is the first of the month. And this is the end of the month, the first of the next month. First of March, first of April. Okay? So I make my payment on my mortgage the first of April. Guess what I did? I just used... First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, all the way through the 30th, I used all that interest. They loaned me that money during that time, I used all that interest. So when I make my $1,000 payment, especially for about the first five to seven years on this loan, out of $1,000, only about $13 to $15 went towards the principal. That's it. That's why you pay, if you borrow $150,000 and get a 30-year mortgage, you look at the end of that paperwork, it'll say you're going to owe $450,000. That's three times. The amount that you borrow because you used all their interest. But if you stop and say, hey, wait a minute, hey, mortgage company, set me up on a split payment. Okay, that's what I want. So I want to pay 500 here and then the other 500 at the end. So if I give you five here, what does that mean? I didn't use all your interest, did I? So I prepaid you before, so I, you can't calculate all the rest of that interest. So now instead of only $13 going towards your payment, you might get like $380 went towards your payment. So look how much you're accelerating your loan and paying it down a lot faster. So now with a 15-year mortgage and you split the payment, you just took four years off of a 15-year mortgage. If you split the payment on a 30-year mortgage, you'll take nine years off. One of the reasons people get 30-year mortgages is you can get more house. More house. Real estate agents love it. Because they get more commission, because they can sell you more house. The mortgage people like it. It's a bigger loan. They get more money. But the smart, the smart consumer will buy a house within their means and get a 15-year mortgage. Yeah, if you get a $150,000 house on a 30-year mortgage, it's a good chance that your house payment with interest, taxes, and insurance could be a thousand dollars. That's it on a hundred fifty thousand dollar house. But if you get a if you get a, a fifteen year mortgage, 
It's a good chance that your house payment will be $1,150. So now it's $150 more. So what happens? Wifey say, I gotta have this house. George, listen, I gotta have it. I will be mad if we don't get it. Well, you can't afford $1,150. It's not in your budget. It was just 1000 And that's what gets people in trouble because now they're paying more because they want this five-bedroom. And we're in the state of Georgia. You can get a five-bedroom for $150,000. Less than that now. So I'm going to say, hey, baby, if we're going to stay at a $1,000 mortgage, then we got to scale back to about $136,000 house. Oh, I don't want to do that. Because, see, you're going to get a 15-year mortgage. You understand? And see, so we want more house. Five bedrooms. We ain't got no kids. What are we supposed to do with the mother bedrooms? Well, our family come in town. Not that much. You know? You sit up here heating four extra bedrooms. You got great rooms that you never even come in. You got big bumps of ceilings that you got to heat. And we don't take into consideration all that maintenance. To have what? To only be in your kitchen, be in your family room, and use one or two of the bathrooms and be in your bedroom. That's it. So really, how much house do you really need? So what we have to look at is getting out of debt, accelerating debt, being able to split the mortgage, you know, and, and just do it smartly. That's all I'm saying. Those are the facts, and we just have to take it from there. The next thing is... So when we talk about back to the credit score, is 30% of your credit score has to do with your balances. So if you have a credit card, and so once you get your credit card, if you have a $300 credit card, it doesn't matter if it's $300 or $300,000 limit, it's judged the same. Are you paying it on time? 35%. Are you keeping low balances, like 7 to 10%, 7 to 10% of the credit limit? So if the credit limit is three hundred thousand, then you need to keep it under thirty thousand. If it's at three hundred dollars, you need to keep it under thirty dollars or less. That's seven to ten percent. You're going to get thirty percent added to your credit. Whether it's three hundred dollars, whether it's three hundred thousand, it's nothing to do with the amount. Whether it's secured or unsecured, it's showing your behavior of how you're paying your bills. It's creating a credit worthiness. And so what happens is is that when you max out your credit cards, then you lose 30% of your score. When people call and say, hey, listen, my credit score is only 680. I've never missed a late payment, never been late ever before in my life. How in the heck is this? It's easy if you know the formula. Guess what? Guess what the problem is? Cards maxed out. Are they? You know they are. Well, that's your problem. Pay them, pay them down to 10%. If you can afford to do it, 7%. Then they do it, and their score jumps up to 750 the very next month. Just like that. But nobody really talks to you about that. Nobody really explains the, the, the gravity of your credit card balances. It's where you could be judged month after month. That credit card balance shows so much. That's why it weighs so heavy. 30%, it shows so much because guess what? People who live with maxed out credit cards what does that mean? It means that they don't make enough money in their job, doesn't it? It means that they're not budgeting. It means that they spend all their income on their job out of a 14-day span. They spend it probably in nine days, and they got five days that they need that credit card every month. So that's 10 times a month they need to max out that card because they're not making it. So what do you think FICO's going to do? FICO supports the lenders from all risks. So they're going to go run and tell the lenders Beware of this person because they're living on the edge and that they're getting ready to face a bankruptcy or late payments. And guess what? There's a good chance you might not get your money. So beware. Here's the score on the judgment, Matt. You take them from there at your own risk. So people say, people listen to a lot of these worldwide leaders talking about credit, and they tell you not to get a credit card. Well, how am I going to establish credit, Einstein? I don't have it like you. I didn't get a break. I didn't used to be a grass cutter and then somebody gave me a break and put me on national TV. I didn't used to be a plumber and somebody gives me a break and puts me on Fox News. I didn't used to be 
live in a trailer and somebody gives me a break and make me a worldwide a person talking about credit. So, therefore, you're making enough money to be able to, you know, to tell people they don't need credit. How about the other 300 million people in this world that's just commoners, that's just regular folks who have ambitions to start their own business, to be able to start their own trucking business by getting one truck at a time or starting a beauty salon or starting a gas station or a corner store. I don't make enough money. I make $35,000 a year. My wife makes uh, uh, $20,000 a year. We're not educated folks, but we work hard. And we got three kids. This money that we make eats up everything. One, we got bad credit, so therefore we're paying double on our car, double on our car insurance, more for our utilities. America's robbing us. So how can we make it? And then you tell me that I don't, then some of these guys tell you not to do a bankruptcy when you're heavily over debt. Sometimes you should to get free. To get free so you can get another start at this thing. So you can begin to rebuild. But also, too, the facts remains is that, you know, you need credit cards it is the most, it is the most applicable way to reestablish credit, more than a car and more than a mortgage. Why? Because you're judged heavier. You can't judge me on my balances on a house. Why? It takes forever to pay it off, correct? You can't judge me on the balances of my car. It takes six years to pay it off, right? But on a credit card, as soon as I get it, it's up to me what I do with it. Give me a thousand dollar limit, I can have it maxed out today, easily, you know, and keep it maxed out. Well, that shows how I'm living because I wouldn't have to touch it if I had other money, correct? No doubt about it. So what I'm saying is that establishing credit card history is huge with creating a credit score, keeping your balances down low. Some people say, I don't want credit cards. Fine, take it and use it to establish your credit. Because what you do is you don't want to use it, no problem. As soon as you get it, fill your cart with gas. Okay? 60 bucks. Then what you do next is your bill statement comes, pay them $55. Leave a $5 or $8 balance on it. Why leave that balance on it? Let them report that back to the credit reporting agency. Why? You're showing activity, that the car is just not sitting there. Because if the car is sitting there idle, stagnant, they're not giving you nothing for it. Okay? Then next, when you get your next statement, pay it totally off. You're at zero now. Then about every three months, repeat that process. Just use it to show a little activity, pay it off. Every three months, then leave it. Pay it off for three months. Then three months later, fill your car back up again. Use it sporadically. Leave a balance once every quarter, and that's it. You're showing activity, and you're building credit. The next factor is your length of credit, your history. That's another important factor. The longer you have credit, the better you are. Okay? Like, say if you got 12 months' worth of credit, and then all of a sudden, here comes Capital One or Chase, a little bit better looking of a credit card, a little bit more stature. And then what you know? Then here comes Chase with a fifteen hundred dollar limit from your secured, which is three hundred. But your secured credit is what got your credit score to go up. Is what brought Chase and them because they got you started. So now all of a sudden you close the Orchard Bank, you close the first Premier credit cards because everybody know they kind of junkyard credit cards. But so what? They report to all three credit reporting agencies. Then when you close them, you just lost fifteen percent of your credit score. Because, see, it's just like how we would judge our children. The longer our children's behavior is good, the more they get. If they do their chores on time, the more they get. If I give them an allowance of $20 a week, and on Monday they give mama back 10 of that 20, and show that they're budgeting and saving, the more they're going to get. So by the time they get 16 years old, and the one child who had that behavior who wants to borrow five more thousand because he saved five thousand to buy a car? What do you think we're gonna say? Absolutely. No doubt about it. They have the great behavior. But the other kid, every time you see one of his uncles, he's begging for money, making inquiries. He promised to pay money back, he don't. He not budging them because when we give him allowance, he goes through his allowance in one hour. 
So he is a horrific credit score. He comes and says, well, I want to be like my brother, and I want you to give me a car too. Absolutely not. Are you kidding me? There's no way that you're going to pay back this money. Your behavior shows that. See? So it, it's quite simple, the, the, the formula. You know, but it's simple after you know it. Okay? Then the next two factors are, one is inquiries, and just leave the inquiries alone. And then types of credit. You know, you want to have a good balance of credit. You don't want to be credit card heavy. You only need about two credit cards to establish a strong score. You know? And, uh, but you don't want 16 retail store credit cards. It's too heavy on the retail side. So you want to have a variety of credit. The six uh, methods to establish credit. Number one is apply for a secured credit card. Maintain a low balance. Low balances are critical to your score. Establish long history. You know, don't, don't, don't close the account. Just play with it. Just use it in your favor. They, you, know, you now know how they judge you. Then use it in your favor on how they judge you. Create an airless late payment history. Reestablish your student loans through deferment or through rehabilitation. Call them. They'll, they'll take what you give them. I promise you. They'll rehabilitate your loan. Or go back to school and get a deferment, you know, until you can do better. You've got to stop the bleeding through this process. Secure credit cards. Get one, get one uh, that you can, you know, it's one of the easiest ways to establish credit. You, want to apply, you can go online and look for secure credit cards. But when you get online, don't get tricked and get a finger hunt or get something that basically is not reporting to the credit reporting agency or something that, you know, basically, you know, is not reporting, you know, like we said, to the credit reporting agency. It's a catalog card. They only report when you don't pay. Like, Happy Hippo is not credit, you know. And also, you can get one by giving, buying a secure bond in the bank, securing a bond in the bank, and then uh, basically barn against that bond. The next thing is the pitfalls of secure credit. Now we said how strong secure credit is. It's strong, please believe me. It is the best way to reestablish credit. It is king, it is numero uno one. But please believe me, if you don't know what you're doing with it, it will crush you and it'll hurt you more than you ever imagined. Okay. Now you're securing your own credit. You're giving one of these credit card companies $300, okay? It really shows some of the cruelty here. So now, I come home Friday. I don't have no money. Can't hang out. Can't do nothing. All my buddies say, what you going to do? I'm telling them, I'm broke. I said, man, we broke too. We all going home. I said, all right, later. So I go home at 6 o'clock. Check the mail. Bang, there's that orchard car. Beautiful. Open it up. Tell me processing fees were sixty dollars. I got two hundred and forty dollars worth of available credit. Call this eight hundred number to activate, and it's on. I text my friends, "Hey y'all, meet me over here at this sports place over here." Cause I just got that credit card. You did? Yeah, I got it. We're gonna have a little fun. Meet me over there about seven thirty. Cool. So we go. I activate my car. I got two hundred and forty dollars worth of available credit. I can't wait. And so we go out and we spend. $220. So I, right there in that one night, don't tell me this don't sound right now. Somebody ain't never did that before. One night, I maxed out my credit by like 95%. And now I have $20 worth of available credit. Yeah. My payment comes on March 4th. Tell me it's due on March 10th. I said, sure, I don't get paid the 15th. But look at the payment, dude. It ain't but ten dollars. You know, I got bad habits, so I'm gonna pay the people on the 15th when I get paid. You know? Cool. When those folks told you they wanted their money on March 10th, they meant it. And if they got their money on March 11th, it's too late. Because they're gonna access a fee of $35 because you are late. You did not get the money when they asked for it. So therefore, you are late. And when they put that late fee onto your balance, it now puts you over the limit. And now your balance is $355.
Your friend's car, hey man, let's go out and hit that card again. Man, that card ain't working, dude. I tried to get gas this morning. I just got it. You just got it. It ain't working already? Nah, it ain't working. So now the next payment comes on April the 4th, due on April the 10th. You don't, you don't pay the $10 on time. Another $75 added to that card. Now you're in the 400s. That's not even included interest and stuff that you have now accruing. So now the card's out of control. You're not paying it no more. After six months of this behavior, the card gets charged off. Then it gets assigned to a collection agency. Then the collection agency adds new derogatory information on your credit report. They add more interest, penalties, legal fees, and more fees. So think about this. You started off with a secure credit card. Okay? Here's where it went, ended up going to. You started off with a secure credit card to establish credit. You used your own money, $300. So the bank never loaned you anything. You understand? Then you go over the limit off, off of one night. And now you owe the bank $1,100 after six months. It was your money. They never loaned you anything. And now you owe them $1,100. Okay. Now the card is a charge-off showing that you owe $1,100. Then it gets transferred over to another category. At first it's in the trade lines and accounts. Now it gets transferred over to collections because the collection picks it up. Now it's on your credit report saying that you owe a collection of, 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 of $2,100 because they added their fees. Then if you don't deal with that collection, it rolls over to another category which is called public records where it goes into judgments, garnishments, and when you hit a garnishment, you're going to do a bankruptcy to stop the garnishment, and now you end up getting a charge off, collection, judgment, garnishment, bankruptcy, all of a sudden that you spent $300 on to get a credit card. That's the pitfalls. And so you got to know what to do. Pay the thing on time, keep your low balances. If you know that you have bad habits, then set yourself up for ongoing payments every 30 days. People say, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't, you need to do that. And with 10, 15, 20 dollars, you set up for ongoing payments to make sure this stuff is paid on time. That's what everybody uses the internet to pay their bills and set up. You can set up through your bank account, you can set up directly with that merchant. You got to do it. You can't trust the mail to come on time all the time because if it doesn't, then guess what? You forget about it, then you got a late payment that's going to be on your credit report for seven years. Now, here's the collection agency scenario. Collection agencies are privately owned business too, and they're also governed by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. And the Federal Trade Commission is, is basically, you know, the ones who govern the credit restoration companies, and they govern govern the credit the credit uh, credit repositories, Equifax, TransUnion, Experian. Okay, they operate under guidelines. Listen to this: they operate under guidelines of the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act. It says fair. Collecting debt. Be fair. Collection agencies ain't fair. You know? They're brutal. And so there's a statute of limitations on debt. And most of this statute is like four years old on credit card debt, on installment debt. Because you already took a penalty for four years. You already been having bad credit for four years. You already been taking on other high credit card loans for four years. How long can you keep me in perjury? You know, how long? So therefore, there's a release of that, and it's statute of limitations. But these collection agencies know how to easily get it back into where you owe it again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to accuse you and bully you of this debt, even though it's past. You don't know. And so now what happens is, is that what I'm going to do is I'm going to accuse you, accuse you, accuse you of this debt. And then I'm going to create a judgment. When I create that judgment, we're on our way to the courthouse. And then I'm going to create a summons for you to appear in court. But I'm not going to give you the date on the summons. I'm going to just tell you that you got to be in Fulton County Court. And so you're already intimidated. You're already scared. They don't have no date on this, so I'm not going to worry about it. What you should do is call Fulton County and ask them, when do I need to appear? Because they don't want you to appear. Because it's past the statute of limitations. They don't have no grounds to collect. 
So when I give you a date and give you an out, then they're coming. They're coming for you, whether you come or not. And when you don't show up, guess what? The judgment is going to rule in their behalf, even though it's past the statute of limitations, right here and at your courthouse. But there's laws through the Federal Trade Commission that are there to protect us. And so what we do here at National Credit Educational Services, we have the document, which is the, uh, the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act document that forces these collection agencies to validate the debt. All you have to do is send them the certified letter with the account number, the name of the original creditor, name of, the, of their office, and the account number. Send it certified. Keep a copy for yourself. Let them get it. So you're going to get the green copy back. Keep all that stuff in the file. They now have to come up with about 21 items. Original contracts, terms and conditions, disclosure statements, your payment history, how much was actually charged off. They can't charge you more than the amount that was actually charged off. And so therefore, all these other penalties and stuff they do, it's not legal. If you cannot come up with these documents within 30 days, you can't harass me. That's the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act that works on the behalf of the consumer, but we don't know. And so that's what we're here to teach you. Next thing, we want to talk about leveraging your credit. People don't realize what a car costs them. They just know that I can drive any one of these cars for $950 a month. That's what I know. A man told me I could drive this, this, or that for $950 a month. I think that's not bad. So I do it. But he doesn't realize what that car really costs. You got bad credit, so you're going to pay between $350 to $450 a month to drive one of these cars. The car got 86,000 miles on it, so therefore it's out of warranty. To maintain a car like that is $3,600 per year. The average is $300 a month. Gasoline, if you're driving it every day, is premium gas. That gas is going to be about $6 a gallon by the summer. It's going to cost you a minimum of $800 a day. I mean, $800 a, a, a month to drive that uh, car in gasoline. See, your real payment is not $950. Your real payment is $2,400 a month. And that's what we don't realize. But all we were looking at was the payment. What's the payment? It's $950. Actual cost, at the end of 72 months of that loan, you paid $172,800 for that car. Almost $200,000 that you paid for that car. And that's not counting how many times you went to the car wash to keep it clean. An armor all cost. I mean, all the stuff that it costs to maintain this car. That's how much you threw away in six years. You pay a 20, 20, 20, it was $2,400 a month. What you could have did was leveraged your credit, went out here and got one of these million dollar houses if you want to spend money like that. Now, it used to be formerly a million dollars. Put a bid on it for three eighty. dollars your, your payment would have been $2,300. A month. That's it. But see, when you find that deal, you can't buy it now because you're driving it. it it's in your car. So, bad choice. After six years later, when you go back to look at the Hummer that he bought, the Hummer now is worth $4,000. You lost $168,800. $168,800. That's what you lost. If you would have bought the house... You could have gained six hundred twenty thousand. Why? Because you'd have got the fifteen-year note. You'd have split the payment, and the housing market would have begun to regain itself. And this is how much asset that you could have had. This is what we're talking about with leveraging your credit. The next thing is, is it's very important to begin to budget. Write down your mortgage and your rent, your car payment, your insurances, your groceries, your gasoline, your car maintenance, your dry cleaning, cell phone, cable bill. Utilities, credit cards, and this is $300 left per month for entertainment for you to hang out. Well, if I got a refrigerator full of food, I got everything paid, then $300 a month, if I'm trying to be on a budget, that's cool. That's enough money for me to be go out and be able to just blow. Next is, my total income for my house is $6,000. My critical expenses 
is fifty four hundred. That includes my three hundred dollars a month to spend. I have a remainder of six hundred dollars a month with compound interest over seventy two months. I could save over sixty thousand dollars. But see, we don't because we're not paying attention to none of that stuff. We're spending all the money we have. Then we're spending our credit card money, and we're just six years later. We're worse off than we were six years ago. We talked about the FICO scoring system, the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, how to protect your credit during hardship, how to regain the financial independence. We've got online tools to show you what your statuses of your credit reports are, and we answered the tough questions, just like this presentation. We'll give you information, and when you call us, your customer of ours, we help you answer tough questions. But we'd rather you to come in. We have Monday night conference calls, Wednesday night conference calls, educating, and then we have Saturday live stream where you can come in person. So our conclusion is to understand everything about credit. Credit is, a, uh, it, you know, is, is the key in achieving financial security. It is important to establish you know, a, a new path going forward. And National Credit Educational Services gives you the resources and tools to be able to make that happen. And we talked about restoring America. And here is our cost. Our cost is a one-time fee of $349 for everything that we talked about. One-time fee. We fight the credit reporting agencies three times on your behalf. Three times. The first cycle that you would get back if you're on a monitoring service, it should be in about 30 to 35 days. If you're waiting for mail, it should be about six to seven weeks. And then you'll get your credit reports back. Anything you get from the credit reporting agencies, bring it back to us so that we can continue to work on your credit. And we are going to do a phenomenal job. We help to restore America by restoring you. We're going to help to put you back into the game, help you to be able to get one of these houses while the prices are down. A great time to leverage your credit. It's a great time to begin to get your credit up so that now maybe you can become an entrepreneur and own your own business. I mean, this is the best time for freedom. It's the best time to get back anything you lost. You know, if you're 60 years old, in the upper 50s, or and you got to thinking if you're written because you lost your job, divorce, or whatever it may be, and you find yourself in a very difficult situation, wondering how you're going to press forward. Get your credit restored. Let us get you in. Let us help to aid you to get you into a house, to where you bought a house for that was formerly two hundred fifty thousand, but you bought it for eighty nine thousand. There's deals like that out there. And then you got a fifteen year mortgage with a house payment of five hundred. You split the payment, and then. 250, 250. If you can afford it, put 300, 300, and that house will be paid off in 9.75 years. By the time you're 70, the property values will have hopefully went up. House could be worth over 225,000. You could sell it, got 225,000 cash. With your Social Security and your retirement, you just regained everything you lost in 9.75 years. We want to help people. If you're young, then you'll be rich by the time you're 35. It's all about leveraging yourself. It doesn't matter where you're at. We're here to help you. And we are National Credit Educational Services. You can go to www.emgtoday.com. www.emgtoday.com to get started. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next week.